Good to be in God's house, isn't it? Let me pray for us as we get started. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you in the strong name of your Son, the one that we celebrate his coming at Christmas. We ask you, Lord, that you'd be with us this morning by your Holy Spirit. It's never enough to just learn something new or interesting about the Bible. We need to see you in your glory. We need to be changed. Would you come by your Spirit and be with us? And we ask that it would all be for the glory of the name of Christ. Amen. Turn with me this morning to our text, Matthew chapter 2. Turn to Matthew chapter 2. It's a familiar text for this time of the year. And we'll begin in verse 1. The Word of God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. If the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, the eternal word of God, if his coming to this earth and taking to himself a human nature, a full human nature, was anything... It was a politically charged event. And Matthew, the gospel writer, gives us just a little bit of detail as to the political situation that Jesus entered this world into. Sometime after Jesus' birth, maybe a few weeks or a few months, but possibly up to two years after Jesus had been born, these magi came to Jerusalem. We don't know a lot about the magi. Probably they were not kings. And we think that because of a famous Christmas carol, don't we? But they were men of court at the very least. They were probably like cabinet members to the president. They were men of high honor who were probably court counselors and possibly dabbled in astrology and philosophy. They were dignified men of position and they came from this strange land. They're probably Persian, ancient Mesopotamia. And here they come into Jerusalem, the city of the kings, the king's city, and they start asking questions, political questions. They're asking around, where is the one born king? Basically, they're saying, no, no, not you, Herod. We want to talk to the real king. We're looking for the one who was just born, the king of the Jews. And God, in his grace, had revealed this to these Gentile noblemen. And as you can imagine, this kind of questioning and this kind of statement caused huge political tension in Jerusalem. And we see that in the text. 
Herod, Matthew says, Herod was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So Herod, being the politician that he is, what does he do? He huddles up with the people who are supposed to know about this stuff. He gets the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he says, yeah, there's this political rumor going around that there's another king, the Messiah maybe, who's to be born. Tell me where that's supposed to happen. So they do. They go back to the prophet Micah and they say, it's supposed to happen in Bethlehem. Okay, he says. So what does he do? Well, he sort of hitches his wagon to these magi, these wise men. He hitches his wagon to them and he says, okay, well, you guys, you go down to Bethlehem and you find them, if you can. And then as soon as you find them, come report to me, because I really want to worship this other king too. And of course, we know that that's a total lie. There's murder and envy and wickedness in Herod's heart. Herod sees this rumor, sees this possibility of a baby-born king for what it is to him. It's a political threat. So he knows where it's supposed to happen. Now I need to know when, and I got to find this kid so I can kill him. And that becomes apparent later in the text. There's a huge infanticide that occurs at the orders of King Herod. But you talk about politics. You know, I think we come to this time of the year and sometimes... We like to glamorize the nativity scene, and we like to glamorize in our own hearts. I do this. It's warm and cozy, and we like it. But we forget that Christ Jesus the Lord came to the real world in all of its sin and sickness, and even in the ugliness of its politics. Jesus enters the scene. I mean, already in Matthew 2, in the few verses that we read, you have foreign dignitaries coming to this country, the country of Israel, to the holy city to worship a king that's not the current ruling sitting king. You have a mysterious baby king, who we know is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then you have a totally paranoid, egomaniac, sitting king, King Herod, who will use every means in his power to crush and stop this political rumor before it starts to get legs. I mean, people start whispering, you got to shut it down. And this is the political scene that our Lord Jesus was born into. And Jesus, he can't even speak, he, let alone say anything in public. He hasn't said one word in public. He probably hasn't said one complete sentence within the confines of his own home. He's a toddler at most. And he is in the center of a huge political firestorm. You imagine this, a toddler. The political ground is shaking, and the baby-born king, what's he concerned about? Well, he's fully human, so he's concerned about eating and drinking and going to the potty and playing and cuddling with his mom and finding new things to get into. Jesus was really a toddler, just like Jesus was really a man. And all of this is swirling around him. Verse 9. After they had heard the king, that is the magi, the wise men, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. 
when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Have you ever wondered about that? Well, they haven't seen the baby. They've seen the star. And you read that and you go, well, you already saw the star. You, you were looking at the stars, and that's what brought you to Jerusalem. But it says, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Think about this. They were led to Jerusalem to look for a new king. They were directed to Bethlehem. But imagine trying to find one kid in a small town. You don't have his name, first or last. You don't have his parents' names. You have nothing. You have no address. God, in his grace, was so kind and merciful and loving towards these wise men. Matthew says, the star stopped over the place where the child was. Whatever the star was, it took them to the house, not just to the town. Wherever it was that Joseph was making a living and providing a place for his young family to live, it took them right to the apartment, right to the house, right to the tenement. And they were full of joy. How could they have ever found, out of all the kids in one small town, how could they have ever found, and yet God took them right straight there? Verse 11, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Use your sanctified imagination with me for a second. You have a convoy of foreign dignitaries who look very dignified. I mean, they're wearing the clothes of high government. There's several of them, and we again, we think from the hymn that it's three. That's how many gifts they brought. This could have been a dozen guys. We don't know. With all of their pack mules and all of their camels and all of their stuff and their gifts and their provisions, they come into this little town and they go right to the apartment where Joseph and Mary and Jesus are staying, filled with joy. And Jesus is a toddler. You know, you, you wonder, well, what, what did he do? I mean, what would you do when you were two strange men showed up at your house? I don't know. Did he, you know, go and run and hide? Did he go bury his head in Mary's lap? I have no idea what he did. But he's crawling around. And there must have been something about them. Mary didn't stop them. However it happened, they ended up in the presence of this toddler. Maybe they were outside in front of their house. I don't know. Maybe they were in the living room. And all of a sudden, these dignitaries, these wise court counselors, fall to the ground, prostrating themselves face down on the ground. And they start worshiping a toddler. Can you imagine? And they really worshiped him. Were they singing? Were they speaking words of praise? I don't know what, but they were worshiping this toddler. And they didn't just worship with words. Talk's cheap, right? Out come the presents. But these are no ordinary presents. 
These are not things you buy for a one- or two-year-old on their birthday. These are regal gifts. Gold and frankincense and myrrh. I mean, you know the value of gold. Frankincense and myrrh are exotic aromas and spices, incense. This is stuff you give to a head of state when you're visiting. This is gifts you give to the president, gifts you give to the king. And they come and they start laying their gifts out. They're worshiping the king of all kings. And it's these men, these wise men, these magi, they hold a very distinct honor in the scriptures. Do you know what it is? These wise men are the first recorded human beings on planet Earth to worship the incarnate Son of God in the flesh. The King of all kings. And they worshiped well. They were so full of joy and they humbled themselves and they worshiped. They gave their good gifts. Here in this text, we have a wonderful and terrible picture of the peoples and kings and kingdoms of this earth. This is not a nice thing that happened that's interesting to know in the life of Jesus. This is a snapshot of 2,000 years of world history. There are only two kinds of people, two kinds of rulers, two kinds of kings in this earth. And that's still true today. There are the Herods of this world who will have no other king but themselves to rule over them. Herod hated the baby. And you have to say, well, why? He's just a baby. Herod did not hate nativity scenes and manger scenes and cozy statuaries on the lawn. Herod hated Jesus because Jesus was a real political threat to his power. And he hated him for it. Has so much changed in 2,000 years? The Herods of this world hate the baby. I mean, you, you read the news, right? All over the world, in our own country... The powers that be, and you'll read headlines like this. Nativity scene removed from whatever public square, right? What is it about, is it plastic baby Jesus and lights and statuaries, is that so threatening? No. The godless rulers of today hate the baby Jesus for the same reasons Herod hated him. Because he's a threat to their power and to their self-rule. Because they know what this book says about the baby king. He grew up and he became a man. And he suffered and he died. And he proved he was the real king by rising from the dead and ascending into heaven. And they hate that. I won't have any other king over me, they say. There's only two kinds. There's that kind, the Herods of this world. And then there are the Magi of the world. There are the king's worshipers. These Gentile nobles outside of the covenant who were so mercifully guided right to Jesus and when they came into his presence... All they could do was fall down on their faces 
and worship. And they were so happy to do it. We see all of this going on, political turmoil. And we we, we got to ask ourselves a question. What is God's response? What is God's response to Herod? What is God's response to the Magi? What is God's response to the, to the Herods of 2,000 years of history and, the 2000, and today? What is God's response to the Magi of history? Even we, his church, who kneel before him and worship the king. Did you know that God had given his response to these events, even these events, hundreds of years before they happened? And only a sovereign God could do that. God made his political statement thousands of years or at least hundreds of years before. Turn with me quickly. To Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2 and verse 1. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Does this sound familiar? It's exactly what Herod did. It's exactly what the godless rulers of our world do. They huddle up and they counsel together and they say, Let's get rid of this rumor. Let's get rid of this threat. This threat who calls himself the king of kings. We're the kings. We won't have God telling us what to do. Now, what do you think God's reaction to this is? Is he up in heaven? Is he worried? Is he saying, oh, no, the kings of the earth, they're counseling together. Oh, what am I going to do? No, that's not the Lord's answer. Verse 4, this is his answer. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. In other words, God laughs in their faces. And then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but listen to what he says. But as for me... I've installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession." Do you hear what the father is telling the son, his appointed king? He's saying, son, ask me for the world, and I'll give you the whole thing. It's yours. Not just the people of Israel. No, no. The ends of the earth. And isn't it appropriate that the first to come and worship on their faces are these Gentile kings from the nations. And some of you are thinking, well, I think it was the shepherds. We know from Luke that the shepherds came. They were right there, right after the birth. And they were overjoyed to see it. They were overjoyed to hear the message from the angels. They were overjoyed to be a part of this thing that God had done. But Luke never records that they prostrated themselves, or that they worship the baby directly. It's these kings. They're from the nations. They come and they bow down. 
God says to his son, his appointed king, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. And then God puts all the kings of the earth, all the Herods and all the Pilots and all the godless rulers through all the earth, presidents, congressmen, despots, tyrants, monarchs, prime ministers. He puts them all on notice concerning this king. He says, Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. The wise men, they they were doing it. He says, do homage to the sun. Another translation will say, kiss the sun. In other words, get down on your faces and kiss my son's feet, kings of the earth. That he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. And then after such a severe and stern warning to the rulers and powers of this world, the psalmist ends with this wonderful, gracious line. He says, how blessed are all who take refuge in him. Do you know what this means, this statement by God concerning his king? It means that we win. And it's not because we're anything. We're just sinners saved by the grace of a loving God. But we win because the king wins. Because the king has won. Because God has installed his king, and it's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And no power of hell, and no modern day Herod will ever change that. Matthew chapter 2, and the whole gospel of Matthew for that matter, they are not given to us so that we can learn cute stories about a baby. They are given to us so that we can understand that the king has come. And he's not just the king of our hearts, although he is that for sure. He's the king of the nations. And God's statement concerning his king, this toddler, who in Matthew chapter 2 is in Bethlehem, God's statement concerning the toddler is not, O kings of the earth, please would you please worship my son. It's how blessed are you if you take refuge now. What great joy, like the Magi, to prostrate yourself and worship the king of the universe in human flesh now. But the alternative is clear. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Because the godless rulers, the Herods of history, they can't escape this. If they don't kneel now, then at the consummation of all things, at the end of a sword, God will say, on your knees, and kiss his feet, and they will do it. It's a victorious reminder of what Christmas is, isn't it? We serve the living, risen Christ, who has proved at his resurrection that he is king over all kings, period. And he rules the nations. 
We see it at the very end of Matthew. Christ is risen. He has proved that everything he has said and done is true and real. He is victorious over Satan and death and hell. And he commissions his church in the closing verses of Matthew. Famous verse. What does he say? Matthew 28, he says... All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Not a part of authority, not some of the authority, not the authority in heaven, but not on earth. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, King Jesus says. And then he gives his church the greatest mission statement, the greatest commission the world has ever heard. He says, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. The mission is rooted in who the king is. He has all the authority. So he sends us on our victory mission, and he says, now go make disciples, baptize the nations, and then teach them how to obey the king, me is what Jesus says. And if if that wasn't enough, he says, surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let me ask you, at Christmas time, when was the last time, wherever it is that you have your prayer time and you worship God in your bedroom, in your living room, here, wherever it may be, when was the last time you worshiped well like the wise men at Christmas, because it's Christmas. When was the last time you got down on your knees and down on your face and you said, Jesus, with a heart that was full, you said, Jesus, you are the king and I love you. And you rule the nations and you rule me. And I am your humble servant. What can I give? Do you give him your best? Do you bow your heart? At Christmas, we celebrate the king's birthday, but we don't do it the normal way we celebrate birthdays. We're not just marking off the years. It's not, you know, happy birthday, 2014, 2014th one. We're not just counting years. We're celebrating the coming of the unstoppable king. And we know that whatever the godless Herods through history, the godless Herods of our day are doing, we know that Christ has won the victory. And we can rejoice at Christmas time. We, the church, ought to be the happiest, merriest, bunch of feasting, joy-filled people on the face of the planet. Because this is true. Jesus is the king. And we should be like the Magi. We don't just say it. Talk is cheap. We do it. And how do we do it? We serve the king. And how do you serve the king? Well, you serve other people. And we ought to do that at Christmas time. And we ought to buy good presents. And I mean good presents like Legos. (laughs) Not because... We're looking for something out there, and we see the poor souls all around us who don't know the king. They're out there this time of year. They're searching for that one thing that they can get that's finally going to make me or someone else happy. But we're not going to buy our gifts that way. We're going to give good gifts as the Lord allows us, and we're going to say, this gift is just in commemoration of the king the greatest gift that was ever given to any of us. 
The greatest gift was a baby king. And he rules and he reigns. Praise his holy name.